Good evening. Welcome, everyone. It's a real delight that, uh, to see you here. My name's uh, Bob Bierke. I'm the Director of Policy Planning with the City of Brampton. You know, one of the things before I uh, started in Brampton, a, a good friend of mine who's a, a chef said that the best food in the GTA is in Brampton, and I'm, I'm sure he's right, because uh, I've had a really good opportunity to sample many things, and some of them in this, this theater. So I hope you all were able to partake of the, uh, the local food we had on the, on the way in. Uh, tonight, I'm um, really privileged to, to be here. This is a fantastic point in time for Brampton. Uh, earlier this afternoon, Council uh, endorsed the, uh, uh, at a special meeting, are, are heading into the official plan, which is really going to build on the, the 2040 vision that had been such a, a huge part of, of Brampton and I think really helps set the stage for where the city needs to go. So tonight, uh, we're at uh, another point in this process where we are now going to have uh, international experts. This is our speaker series. Uh, we're heading into a process to really learn from uh, others and then sort of dig deep ourselves for how to go from where we are now, uh, be inspired by the vision, really look at those, those aspects that, that make sense and the things we really want to drive forward. And, really look at the plan we want to create as we, we move forward uh, in the city. This is a fantastic set of opportunities we have in, in front of us. So this is the first night of four, uh, where over the next uh, uh, four weeks, we're going to hear from international experts on some of the bold moves that uh, and bold thinking required to make that uh, 24 vision real. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsor for the evening, International Homes. Uh, so your contribution and support to this uh, great city building initiative uh, and uh, other initiatives in Brampton is very much appreciated. Um, so without further ado, I'm not going to spend much time here. I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew McNeil, who is our uh, uh, strategic lead. He's uh, leading the official plan process. So he's going to uh, take it away from here. And uh, so please, uh, as you listen to the speakers, think about things you want to ask them. We're going to have some time. Uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic evening, and I really encourage you to take part in this, uh, get engaged, and the rest of the opportunities we're going to have as we, we build a, a fantastic plan for Brampton. So thank you, and I'll invite a Andrew to come up. Thank you, Bob. We're going to be introducing tonight's speakers shortly, but I, would, I wanted to just quickly highlight the fact that next Wednesday we will have Stephen Lewis and Zara Abraham here that will be talking about the global climate change imperative and the role for cities as well as building a city that values diversity and inclusiveness. We hope that a lot of you can come out and hear that. On February 5th, we will have um, Gil Penalosa, Brad King, and Pamela Blaze, who will be talking about the importance of arts and culture, the changing face of employment in our region, and Brampton's role in the future and how we can build a more vibrant and healthy city for all ages. And in conclusion, on February 12th, we're going to focus on how we can merge transportation, land use, and economic development objectives to build a more complete city that's walkable and easier to get around. We'll also look at the economics of suburbia and why it's imperative that we start to change the way we grow. And the speakers will have that night, Ian Lockwood, Dan Burden, and Joe Minicosi. So we hope that uh, we can entice you all back for, for those events. We have some entertainment lined up in future nights as well. Uh, Ryan Douglas, an up-and-coming star in Brampton, is going to be performing on January 29th. Wings of Passion on February 5th. And we'll, uh, we'll close out with an exciting act on February 15th. Um, as Bob mentioned, uh, the great food in the lobby this, this evening. I want to acknowledge Das Brezel House and La Favorita for providing the food. And when you come back each night, we're going to have a different selection of samples for you. We've got some slides that we had prepared that talk about Vision 2040. If you haven't been and checked out the vision, uh, please go to brampton.ca slash 2040vision. That's providing the framework for what we are doing. Um, the goal behind the speaker series is really to grow capacity within the community about some of the critical issues that are facing Brampton as we grow and we move to implement Vision 2040 and create what we're going to call Brampton 2040 plan. Um, the goal is to have what is encapsulated in the vision um, incorporated into a new official plan by the end of this term of council. Um, so hopefully by the year end of, of 2021, we will have a new plan ready to unveil before council. 
With that, I would uh, welcome Mayor Patrick Brown and Councillor Charmaine Williams to provide some, some remarks as well. Well, welcome uh, to our first uh, speaker series uh, with this Brampton 2040 engagement of the city. My name is Patrick Brown. I have the honor to be mayor of the, the, the great city of Brampton. I'm joined by Councillor Charmaine Williams. Charmaine was nodding to me when you were talking about the great food in Brampton. We have many things we're proud of, but I think we have every culinary delight in the world in one city. Uh, so it's great that we'll be showcasing some of our great local restaurants as part of the celebration uh, of our 2040 vision. And what a list of great speakers we have. This is going to be the first of many events that will help transform Brampton 2040 vision from a concept of what Brampton will become over the next quarter of a century into an actionable plan to guide Brampton's growth. I was saying to uh, David Crombie earlier, he, you, yourself and Ken are the guinea pigs, but this is the first night of having august speakers here at the Rose Theatre. We're gonna use this plan to guide housing industry offices and shops as well as the infrastructure needed to support a growing city, including streets, parks, transit, schools, and recreational facilities, everything that makes a community a community. The Brampton 2040 Speaker Series is a step toward achieving our 2040 vision goals and the five term of council priorities of a city of opportunities, a mosaic, a green city, a safe and healthy city, and a well-run city. Tonight, I'm pleased to be introducing your speakers, Ken Greenberg and David Crombie. David and Ken played a significant role in altering the, tra the trajectory of the city of Toronto into what has become one of the top cities in the world. This required strong leadership, and what we're gonna to hear tonight is about what's needed in Brampton to have that similar transformation. As part of our journey, Ken Greenberg, an urban designer, teacher, writer, former director of urban design and architecture for the City of Toronto, and principal of Greenberg Consultants, has for over four decades played a pivotal role on public and private urban initiatives focusing on the rejuvenation of downtowns, waterfronts, neighborhoods, and on-campus master planning, regional growth management, and new community planning. Tonight, he will bring a conversation about transformational change and city structure. He's also uh, given advice uh, in Amsterdam, I'm told played a senior role in planning with the city of Boston, and more recently is a recipient of the Order of Canada. So talk about uh, an accomplished speaker. The second speaker of the night is the Honorable David Crombie, a politician, professor, and consultant, a popular mayor of Toronto from 1972 to 1978. David, uh, by the way, I was born in Toronto in May of 78, so I was a resident of yours briefly. Um, David also played a key role in federal politics from 1978 to 1988, where he had several cabinet positions, including the Minister of Indian and, and Northern Affairs, Secretary of State, and Minister of Multiculturalism. Um, I was mentioning to David that about a month ago we gave the key uh, to the city to former Premier Bill Davis in this very building. Uh, and he was part of a society, uh, an extinct species right now called the Red Tory, that uh, I know you uh, share a similar philosophical outlook on. Um, and so it's great to have someone who has had such experience at both the municipal and the federal level um, to share uh, your insights. You also chaired the Royal Commission on the Future of the Toronto Waterfront, and from 2001 to 2007, served as the president and the CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. More recently, he has served in various advisory capacities to the city and, and to provincial governments, and tonight, you're gonna talk about a conversation on city building bold moves. We are excited to provide Bramptonians with the opportunity to be inspired by world-renowned leaders as well as share ideas on what Brampton should become over the next quarter of a century. So for everyone here, I just want to say thank you for being part of the conversation. This vision for our city is premised on the fact we need citizens to participate. There's no city that is strong and vibrant that doesn't have the engagement of its citizens. The fact that you're here tonight 
is a signal that you care about our city. Uh, and we know this event is just going to grow as we have these speaker series on Wednesdays. We know this is just going to grow and be an opportunity for our citizens to be engaged in this journey that is Brampton 2040. So our first speaker I invite to the podium is Ken Greenberg. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you, Brampton, uh, for allowing me the privilege to work with you, with the council, with the staff, on a remarkable journey that I believe you are going through. <clears throat> for the last uh, month, since May, I have been working closely with Richard Forward, with Bob Bierke, and particularly with Yvonne Young, the manager of Urban Design, and the staff at the city building on the 2040 vision. And I'm gonna share some of that with you, but I'm calling this talk a tale of two cities because it connects very much to the experience I had with David Crombie, with whom I am truly honored to share the stage. David um, has been my great mentor, friend, teacher since he was mayor in Toronto and I joined city staff as a young architect. <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit about what happened then in Toronto and what's happening now in Brampton. And the, you might not immediately perceive this commonality, but what characterized both those moments, that moment in Toronto and this moment in Brampton, is a will to make a shift from a mid-20th century auto-oriented city to a denser, more sustainable, mixed-use, and walkable urban place. Whoops. Oh, good. So Brampton has played a really interesting role in this. And I go back to Bill Davis, who in June of 1971, told the provincial legislature uh, when he announced the decision to cancel the Spadina Expressway, and I'm just going to read you this quote because it, it had a profound impact on the future of Toronto. We must place our reliance on means and methods other than those which will encourage and pro proliferate the use of the passenger car as a basic means of transportation. We must make a decision as to whether we are trying to build a transportation system to serve the automobile or one which will serve people. If we are building a transportation system to serve the automobile, the Spadina Expressway would be a good place to start. But if we are building a transportation system to serve people, the Spadina Expressway is a good place to stop. That was, talking about a bold move, that was a complete game changer. 1972, the next year, David, young David Crombie, you see on the left here, um, had just become mayor. And you can see what was called the Reform Council on bicycles on the right. And you might recognize me in the lower slide with my crew of urban designers. Now, ironically, and I have no explanation for this, we're all huddled around a car and the councillors are on bicycles. Uh, very embarrassing, but uh, there are many ironies. Um, the city adopted, under David's leadership, something called the Central Area Plan. And the key idea of the Central Area Plan was that people would live in downtown Toronto. Downtown Toronto, prior to that, had been conceived of what planners call a CBD, a central business district, essentially large office buildings. And at that moment, the big bank towers were starting to appear at King and Bay. And the city adopted a policy which proposed a radical shift, think of your 2040 vision, which basically said, we're going to reorient the growth. We're going to bring people back down into downtown. And at that point, the population of downtown was extremely small. There are now 250,000 people living in downtown Toronto, and by 2041, that population is expected to double to half a million. This was contested. 
the development industry, those who had assembled all this land, wanted to continue building office buildings. It was very hard to persuade them to build residential. And so building the case, eventually going to the Ontario Municipal Board, uh, bringing in very talented legal staff, both within the city and outside advisors, getting the architectural community, some key, very brave members of that community to assist in showing how this could happen all took place. And then we started to get proof of concept. So the St. Lawrence neighborhood, which you may know, on the east side of downtown, now houses about 10,000 people. It is a wonderful example of a mixed income, mixed use neighborhood. Running through the middle of it on a former railway right of way is very appropriately named David Crombie Park which you see in this illustration. But when the city made this move, and I, I would say that is similar, again, to what you're going through, this was not just a planning idea. It was basically responding to something that was happening in society. There were big forces propelling this shift, and what was happening as a kind of undercurrent is the post-Second World War North American dream of what you see pictured here, and I actually took that image off a website called The American Dream, was to have the house, the car, and eventually it became a fleet of cars for every adult in the household on your own separate piece of land, was being replaced already back in the late 1970s by a competing dream that reflected very different priorities among young people, and especially um, what people were looking for by in voting by, with their feet was choosing to live in a neighborhood where they could walk to buy their groceries, get access to transit, and do many things in close proximity. So the city, in a, in a way, it was both leading and following. So my first job when I was recruited by David and the Reform Council to start an urban design group, literally from scratch, in the city, I was handed this piece of geography called the East Downtown at the time. And what the East Downtown was, it was where Toronto started, or very close to it, the original 10 blocks laid out by Lieutenant Governor Simcoe. It had some wonderful heritage buildings which were rapidly being torn down, but it had become a giant parking lot. Essentially cheap parking for office workers who worked at King and Bay. The St. Lawrence Market, which you may recognize in the middle of the image, was actually slated for demolition because no one was using it. You can probably recognize the back of the Flatiron Building. So what we did and this is very similar to the work we're doing here in Brampton now, is we reached out to everybody who was interested in making the change in the city, the property owners, the developers, the local community, the design community, and we started to develop what I called the unofficial plan. And the unofficial plan was getting everything that was happening on the same page. So. People had been working on their own individual projects in silos, in a vacuum. And by preparing drawings like this, now obviously we didn't have computer simulations, this was all hand-drawn, but people could see a picture of a neighborhood coming back to life. And as this was going on, we had the advantage of a, one of the most remarkable thinkers of the 20th century, in our presence, Jane Jacobs. Jane and I both arrived in Toronto in 1968 from New York within months of each other. I was bold enough as a student, an architecture student at the University of Toronto to reach out to her having been deeply affected by her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And I asked Jane if she would give me a critique of my student project at the University of Toronto. And unbelievably, she was kind enough to do so, and she became a great friend and mentor until 2006 when she died. And here she and I are sitting judging a competition for housing on main streets, which was one of the initiatives of the Reform Council. 
But what was really going on was that Toronto, like many cities and city regions across North America, was in the midst of a profound paradigm shift. It was affecting how we moved in the city, people shifting to transit, obviously putting enormous pressures on our transit system, to cycling. Who would have imagined that the bicycle, which had become a kind of toy or some, for children or something that people used for sports, would become a major form of transportation, as it has. We were changing where we lived and worked. People were moving into the downtown, following the big change uh, and driving the big change of the central area plan. We were getting together in public space, and we were beginning to understand the changing nature of our place in the natural world, and that all of those things were happening. So this, I showed you the parking lots a moment ago. This is the proof of concept. This is that St. Lawrence area. Now, you will not find a single surface parking lot. What you will find is a vibrant, dynamic, mixed-use, mixed-income neighborhood that has all the accoutrements of daily life in, pro in close proximity and great public spaces. So here are some of the things we did. I, um, David will remember our Commissioner of Public Works as we named it then, Ray Bremner. Ray was a crusty old road builder, a pretty tough character, and I worked closely with Ray. I became, in a way, a kind of protege of Ray's dealing with capital budgeting, and he and his engineers became persuaded that they were just as responsible for pedestrians and cyclists as they were for cars. That was a huge breakthrough. So we actually took lanes out of Front Street, which you see here, to widen the sidewalks, to change the nature of Front Street. Behind the Flatiron Building, and this is the second emanation of Berksey Park, you saw it as a lawn just prior to that. It had been one of those parking lots. All those beautiful uh, cast iron facades that you see on the south side of the park have been restored. New buildings have come in, and the neighborhood has really come to life. So these, these were great stories, and I spent 10 years at the city of Toronto. After David, I worked for two more mayors. I worked for John Sewell, I worked for Art Eagleton. And in 2011, or after, sorry, in uh, 1987, after working at the city for 10 years, I took all my learning in Toronto on the road and I worked in a whole series of cities in North America, in Europe, in other places. And so I wrote a book in 2011 telling those stories. And I say stories deliberately because it, it's not dry stuff. It's about people. It's about people who embrace these ideas. It's about community people. It's about people in government. It's about political leaders. It's about entrepreneurs who risk their dollars to make things happen. And so that, that was the first book. And then last year in 2019, watching Toronto transform phenomenally, all building on that foundation that we had laid back in that period, I wrote a second book called Toronto Reborn. And it's my contention that Toronto is emerging now as one of the most remarkable cities in the world, one of the fastest growing and remarkable because of not only the growth, but of socially who we are. And what I'm gonna say about Toronto counts even more for you. We are a city where over 50% were born in another country. Your number is much higher. We're a city where over 50% identify as visible minorities. Your number is much higher. But the key is we actually value that. We see that as a positive. It's not just a slogan. It truly is our greatest strength. And David and I are both on the board of an organization called Myzeum slash Toronto Experience, which is all about celebrating that quality of Toronto and the Toronto region as a place of arrival. So I'm just gonna flash through some images of transformation. And I'm really showing you this to convey the idea that this is not only likely, 
it happens. It's quite possible and really hopefully to inspire you. So what you see here is something called the Kings. When Barbara Hall became the mayor of Toronto, we had 400 acres of former industrial lands on both sides of downtown on the two shoulders, like the image I showed you of what was called the East Downtown, largely parking lots, buildings being torn down, uh, traditional industries had left, and we did another radical thing after the central area plan. We said we'll remove all land use zoning and we'll simply allow people in what were formerly designated as industrial areas to do any use, to live there, to work there, to open up shops, to do pretty much anything governed only by provincial laws around toxicity and with built form controls. And what has happened is remarkable. Uh, my wife, Etsy, and I, who's here with me tonight, moved in to one of the first new residential buildings in the area over 20 years ago in this neighborhood, just at the end of the street that you see here. And in the 20 years that followed, by this shift in public policy, this is the kind of thing a plan can do. And in this case, it was just removing a prohibition some 50,000 housing units were created by the private sector, and more people have ended up working in King Parliament and King Spadina, known as the Kings, than ever did during the height of the industrial era. And for those of you who know Toronto, these are two of the most dynamic areas in the city. Another big change, Regent Park. Regent Park, built right after World War II, was one of the oldest and largest public housing projects in the country. It had become somewhat of a frightening place. It was two big super blocks, but it was an extraordinary immigrant reception area. And there was a real sense of community. People were poor and they lived in a dilapidated environment, but there was a real feeling of solidarity. And I, starting in 2002, I worked with the Regent Park community, Derek Ballantyne, and I'm mentioning names because the names are important. These are real people who made a difference. Derek was the head of Toronto Community Housing. We went to the community with a blank slate and we developed a set of principles and what people really wanted to be was a normal neighborhood. And so we took the two big super blocks and we turned them into 24 small city blocks, creating a fine grain. We introduced mixed income. The project is about two thirds complete now and is an enormous success. And what you see at the bottom of the image is something called the Spectrum for the Arts, which is a cultural hub in the middle of this community. And people are sitting out on the street on a film night in the summer, uh, watching movies outside. Another project of mine is called the Bentway, which is a space under the Gardner Expressway next to Fort York. And finding common ground, shared space, was again one of the things that we gave a lot of attention back in those days. And surrounding this area, former industrial sites, including Molson's, Massey Ferguson, Inglis, had all abandoned the area, the railway lands, 200 acres of roundhouses and marshalling yards. And there were, by the time that image on the upper left was taken, there were 77,000 people living in new vertical neighborhoods surrounding this area. I wrote an article in 2011 in a little publication put out by the Friends of Fort York called The Fife and Drum, and I speculated that the fort, the 43 acres of the fort, which is right beside this elevated portion of the highway, and the space under the highway could be a central park. Four years later, in 2015, I was contacted by Judy Matthews, who had been a colleague of mine at the city, and her husband, Will, great philanthropists. And this is one of the stories I tell in the book of how, in very short order, with tremendous collaboration from city staff, from Waterfront Toronto, from Artscape, this has been transformed into a magnificent public space. Public space is at the heart of this. And my contention in the book is that in a heterogeneous society like ours, nothing is more important or few things are more important than having places 
where we meet and get to know each other face to face, live, not mediated by screens, not mediated through the windshields of cars, but actually standing on the same ground. So in the heart of our neighborhood, and the building where Etienne and I live is at the back of the photograph you see at the bottom, we had this park, and the park had started life in 1793 as a burial ground for Fort York. It then, in 1834, when the city expanded into the military reserve, became a park. It had become all but deserted until the kings came along, and it is now the throbbing heart of a lively neighborhood. Streets is another issue, and you're seized with that. Part of the discussion in council today was about the next decisions you will make about how you spend capital dollars on streets. Queen's Key, which you see here in Toronto, has gone through an unbelievable transformation. When I was a student in architecture, I worked in the Queen's Key Terminal, which is the building you see at the back of the upper photograph. It was a warehouse, and I worked for two of my professors who had a small architectural firm there. When the federal government purchased the land to create harbor front, one of the first gestures we did, and this goes to something that Yvonne and I talk a lot about, which is called the meanwhile strategy. What do you do first? How do you get things started? We created something called the Harborfront Passage by taking these sewer pipes and creating a safe place where people could actually walk through this area, through the middle of this industrial area, protected from traffic. Eventually, through an international competition, Queen's Key has become the great public space that you see below. Um, the heavy rail, which was in the top photograph, has given way to an LRT with a broad pedestrian promenade and really uh, a great face for the city, a front porch on the water. Being smart about the resources that you have and innovative is critical. And Toronto has come up with something called the King Street Pilot. Because of the enormous success of the Central Area Plan and of the King's Initiative, so many people are living in downtown Toronto that the King streetcar could no longer function. It was in perpetual gridlock. And so the city came up with a unique made in Toronto solution for King Street, which was simply the idea that if you were driving on King Street, you could only go one block and you had to turn right. That's it. That's the idea, and what it did is it got rid of all the through traffic and changed the character completely. It also liberated a whole extra lane that has become outdoor patios and public space, and the King car now carries 80,000 people per day, which is more than many subway systems. The relationship to nature, the Leslie Street spit, which you see here, now known as Tommy Thompson Park, was created to form an outer harbor, a huge outer harbor, which came to naught because container ships got too big to make their way through the St. Lawrence Seaway. So we had this landform extending five kilometers out into Lake Ontario. The first motivation is how do we monetize this? How do we get luxury yacht clubs? How do we do all the things that would commercialize this space? and a group called Friends of the Spit, which I was part of, I lived in the beach in the eastern end of Toronto at the time, got together and we fought for the very simple idea of let nature simply take this over. Let's have a place without cars, where we have what became, not through the work of landscape architects, but simply by nature creating succession one plant species leading to another, flora and fauna, into a magnificent park jutting out into the lake. The Lower Don, and here I would make a parallel with your river walk, had a floodproofing problem. Back in 1912, the Toronto Harbor Commission had basically filled in what they called a swamp on Lake Ontario, which we would call the greatest wetlands on the lake if we were looking at it today. And they took the Don River, which had fed this wetlands, and they diverted it into a right angle channel. And it was silting and flooding and creating uh, a great vulnerability for downtown. 
similar to the vulnerability that you had from the flooding in 1948 with the branch of the Etobicoke Creek running through your city. And so, again, lots of steps on the way, but the city and Waterfront Toronto ended up doing an international competition and they bundled together the issue of flood proofing, creation of new neighborhoods, park creation, municipal services, urban transportation, all of these things into one holistic design problem. And I was lucky enough to be on the winning team with Michael Van Valkenburg, a great colleague from New York and Boston. And as we speak today, uh, a project is underway on the Lower Don. It's a $1.25 billion project, which is creating a flood-proofing solution by creating 100 acres of parkland into which the river can spread out and setting the stage for new neighborhood creation. And I would contend that your river walk offers just us a possibility for transportation. Here's another great story. Um, an institution as city builder. Uh, Sheldon Levy was the president of Ry Ryerson University and he liked to call himself a city builder. He was a self-described city builder. And he was extraordinarily annoyed that people referred to Ryerson University as the university behind Sam's. Sam, the record man, at the corner of Gould and Young was a very popular destination. Some people may remember it. And so I worked with architects at KPMB, other colleagues, and we did a master plan for Sheldon. And one of the things that came out of that master plan is the beautiful student learning center designed by the Norwegian firm Snoheda, which you see here. And I would draw a parallel with your CFI, which is a signature iconic building which you're planning to build uh, beside the GO station just off Main Street. It's a game changer. So these are all the stories I tell in the book, and there are many, many more. And in every case, what I'm interested in, and what I, the story I want to tell is, how did this happen? Who was involved? Who were the people who actually made these things take place? And most importantly, the idea that as these individual acts of transformation were occurring within a policy framework, like your 2040 vision and now the uh, official plan that you're creating, what happens is the city transforms. It becomes a different city. The pieces of the puzzle start to weave together. They form nodes and spokes, and they change our perception of the city. And I'm using these three maps to illustrate the point. On the top, you see the way we used to think our mental maps of the city were defined by highways, the Don Valley Parkway, the Gardner Expressway, the, four, the 401, the 427, and the major arterials. What we're shifting to is a new way of understanding the city and its relationships by the two maps on the bottom. One of them on the left is the transit network, which far more people are using than those who are driving. And the second is all these emerging trail systems in the ravines and the valleys. And so this shift in gears, this shift in the way we perceive and understand space is profound. And what it's doing is shifting the focus from individual discrete spaces that we drive to, to networks of space that we can access intuitively on foot or on bicycle or on some form of active transportation. The opportunity to piggyback these initiatives on infrastructure investments like the Riverwalk or like the uh, All Day Go service that you're getting is key, stormwater management, flood proofing, and so on. And integrating these with your valleys, what we call the ravines in Toronto, what you call the valleys. And this, in the council meeting that I sat in on today, the valleys were mentioned as a key identity feature. So these, and again, I, I want to give credit to David Crombie, these maps of the watershed, the entire watershed up to the Oak Ridges Moraine and the recharge area for our drinking water, were something that David brought into our consciousness when he was the head of the Waterfront Regeneration Trust. And what he got us to see 
is that we were a waterfront city, not for the narrow strip of land along the edge of Lake Ontario, but for the hydrology which penetrated our entire urban region. And so this became an extremely powerful and important way of understanding our place in nature. And community initiatives like the West Toronto Rail Path began to spring up uh, as different parts of that network were animated. One of the jobs I had working for David was to find a way to get a trail, the Martin Goodman Trail across the waterfront, which was actually paid for by the Toronto Star to honor Martin Goodman, uh, a publisher of the Star, along 20 kilometers of the Toronto waterfront. But then even harder was to work with CN and CP to get up the Don Valley to Pottery Road and the Brickworks. And getting those trails to start to happen, and you have, you have an opportunity, which I'll show in a moment, to get all the way down to Lake Ontario from here through the valley of the Etobicoke Creek. This is a new addition to that, which is remarkable. This is called the Meadow Way. It's on a hydro corridor, 13 kilometers. It will be funded by the Conservation Authority and the Weston Foundation. It weaves together any number of neighborhoods, schools, public institutions, playgrounds, and it connects the Don Valley to the Rouge River Park. So what I learned out of all this, and I took this learning on the road after Toronto, and one of the first places I took it to was St. Paul on the Mississippi River, where I worked again for three mayors and 10 years in the transformation, is that cities are our most remarkable human creation. They have an incredible capacity to learn, to recover, and to adapt. So what you see here in these four images, upper left is St. Paul when what, what the ecologists would say it climaxed. It reached a point where the edges of the Mississippi River had been hardened for the barge fleet. You won't see a single tree on the upper right, it exhibited that same characteristic of being a giant parking lot, which I showed you at the edge of downtown Toronto. The lower left is a vision plan that I developed working with the staff in St. Paul, creating a design center, bringing all the departments together, and then some of the implementation on the lower right, and a similar kind of transformation that became known as the St. Paul Renaissance. Success now goes to those cities that are capable of playing chords, not single notes, to build sustainable neighborhoods, places where people can live and work, great streets, local shopping, services, transit, a mix of incomes, and have the density to support all of that. And critical in that is leveraging transit. And so you're in this wonderful position now of getting all day go service and getting the LRT coming up here, Ontario and using that not for park and ride, but to build communities at those places, as what happened on the Young Corridor. So if you look at Young Street, north of downtown, at Young Eglinton, Young St. Clair, and Young Davisville, at every one of those places, you have the equivalent of a city of 20 to 30,000 people living and working within walking distance of the station. Another thing I learned was that sustainability is not an add-on, it's not a category, but it's a way of synthesizing and connecting everything you do. It's a DNA of overlap and integration. So every phase of every project that we work on should have places to live, places to work, public space, access to transit, access to nature, and we should really strive to make all those things present in every phase and carry that through the project. Another thing I learned is you can't just do this top down. The community has got to be deeply engaged. So you have to keep talking about it. You have to walk with people. You have to show them how the change is gonna occur. And I know that Andrew McNeil has a whole program of engagement laid out for people in this community as the official plan is created. Another thing I learned from Jane Jacobs who said to me, the best plans are the plans that liberate other people's plans. You can only think of so much. And then after that, it's up to the people who take over the place and give it life and animate it. This is Regent Park and a, a weekly market that takes place 
in Regent Park. In a really good plan, when you do the plan and then you look back four, five, six, ten years after, there will be a whole bunch of things you never could have anticipated that are drawn to the plan like a magnet because it's created the framework for those things to happen. So when we did the plan for Regent Park, we didn't imagine the spectrum for the arts, what the aquatic center, which became the best indoor swimming pool in Toronto, a cricket pitch because people in Regent Park, like people in Brampton, are mad about cricket. Any number of institutions and uses that we could not have preconceived. And finally, this transformation, this paradigm shift, make no mistake, this is not about a lifestyle choice. We are now at the point where we have to understand that this is about the future of our species on the planet. In our country, 80% of us live in a handful of city regions, like the Greater Toronto Hamilton area. In the world, over 50% of people are now living in cities. And if we don't solve these problems in cities, if we don't deal with climate change, if we don't deal with the environment, um, we will be in very, very serious trouble. So very quickly, I'm just going to relate everything I've told you to Brampton. So Brampton, outside of the downtown where we are now, which was a mid-19th century, small, very interesting, compact city, has grown largely in the decades since World War II around the automobile. And so the form that you see is the ubiquitous North American form of suburban development. It has these huge arterials. Now, this is from Google Earth. That's why there are no cars there, because of the time they take the photographs. You know what it looks like on a normal day. And then low-density, single-family neighborhoods, which may be wonderful in some ways, but that combination is not a sustainable form of development. So in 2018, you and your council made a, an extremely important decision with the 2040 vision, uh, led by Larry Beasley. Larry is a friend and colleague, and I called him when I was contacted by Brampton uh, to come and help by working with the staff. And I said, Larry, do you think, is this a real thing? Should I do this? And he said, absolutely. He came away from his work with this community, enormously impressed by the will to actually make that change. So you're growing at an astonishing rate. You may be the fastest growing city in Canada at this point. You're going to become a million people by 2040 or 2041. The real question is where does that growth grow? Does it go into more sprawl in the few areas you have left where you could do that? Or you, do you direct it to places where it can be have the characteristics that I've been talking about, produce those walkable, mixed, more productive, more sustainable kinds of communities. And that's what the 2040 vision was all about, was identifying those places in your urban fabric where that could happen. You have some incredible advantages that you can play on. The investment in transit that's coming, just to take the two that I mentioned, the now commitment to here Ontario coming up to Steeles and all day service on the go with three stops in Brampton is an enormously powerful armature on which you can direct growth. The physical makeup of your community is extraordinary. I am inspired by it. And I have to tell you that when I sat in the council meeting this morning, uh, I've heard the land acknowledgement, which many are doing now very appropriately. But the next thing I heard was a rendition of O Canada set to the Sultans of Spring, of String, uh, with a, a beat that really expresses the feeling of this community. It was, it was remarkable. And then there were three proclamations. One of them had to do with Lincoln Alexander, and acknowledging his role in Canada. Lincoln Alexander actually grew up on Draper Street in my neighborhood, so it was very familiar to me. The second one had to do with the Tamil community here, and the third had to do 
with taking a stand on Islamophobia. And in each case, a group of people representing those communities came forward and spoke to the proclamation. And it was truly moving because it, it became very real for me that there's something going on here in human terms in the way you are all coming together in this community. And that relates to the next thing, which is why you have this amazing talent pool within this community on this tech corridor between Toronto and Kitchener-Waterloo and a young dynamic population that has extraordinary skills. So these are things you can tap into. Um, you have the Zoom transit system, which is one of the most intensively used bus rapid transit systems in the country. You have proximity to Pearson Airport. You have um, investments coming in post-secondary education. I mentioned the skills in your population. A multi-generational living style, which is quite unique and different. And putting all these things together, you have enormous ingredients to work with. So, getting away from auto dependency, the same as we had to deal with in Toronto. You've already developed plans to build on those key investments that I've talked about to expand the transit networks to make missing connections. This is a very, very big decision, and I know your council is debating this now. Do you continue to invest in widening arterial roads to facilitate more automobile traffic, or do you shift investment as we did in Toronto back in those days? When I want to go back to Bill Davis and his statement about the Spadina Expressway. Do you shift investment into transit and active transportation? Do you take the opportunity to identify those places through your official plan review where you want to direct that growth? Do you turn this downtown, which is unique in the region, in the 905, this is the only place on the GO system, with a possible exception of Port Credit, which is a little different, that actually has a real urban place on the GO system, not just the parking lot. And how do we capitalize on that? How do we make this downtown fully come alive? And part of that, and I showed you that map that I did in the St. Lawrence area in the beginning, is creating this plan where everybody can see what everybody else is doing and identifying, defining the common ground that ties everything together. And I have to say, we are having a phenomenal time with the staff of all the departments, with people from Peel Region, with all the agencies, in developing these plans together. Reimagining the street level in downtown. The plans are already there. The environmental assessment is ready to go as soon as you sort out bus rapid transit. It will make an enormous difference. The river walk, which I've mentioned, has the potential to turn something which has been a hidden jewel buried behind buildings, barely visible. People have said to me, where's the river in Brampton? I've never seen it. And if you go across the bridge on Queen Street, you might never know it's there. It has the potential to become a great iconic green space in the heart of your city. And I mentioned the connectivity. Having a trail system like the trail up the Don Valley that goes all the way up to Edwards Gardens and goes down to the lake, you have the potential for a trail that would go right through your community and all the way down to Port Credit. Connectivity at the regional scale, also the, the Here Ontario announcement and the three go lines is another asset that you can play off. So Queen Street, the Queen Street corridor, which was identified in the 2040 vision, is something we're devoting a lot of attention to trying to figure out now. And this could be a place that will house up to 60,000 people in new, high-quality, walkable neighborhoods. And so, through something called the development permit system, we're working on developing a concept for these lands on pre-approving and bringing in sympathetic developers, and there are many who are really anxious to play a role in this, and creating this series of neighborhoods along the Queen Street corridor, along with the transformation of Queen Street itself. And then drilling right down into the fabric of that neighborhood 
we're talking about the 20-minute neighborhood, that you could find most of your daily life needs within 20 minutes walking of where you live and creating community hubs. And we're talking to the two school boards and the library and the parks department and all, and Peel Health, uh, all of the entities that people need to access in terms of public services and bringing them into settings where they're organized around public space at the heart of these neighborhoods. The next thing I want to say, and this, this is something I've learned all the way through my career, and I owe this to David. When David and his colleagues recruited me, they recruited a bunch of other people to come into the city of Toronto, and you have a bunch of new recruits here in Brampton. You're building a team. This is a team sport. It's a massive undertaking. As I say here, it takes a village. And these are some of the people I've been working with over these past months since May, uh, engaging in workshops, building models, doing site visits, brainstorming, doing lateral thinking, problem solving, and essentially nurturing a collaborative culture in city building and people who will play a hands-on role in this transformation. One of my favorite images that we are working on is this one, which shows downtown, the Riverwalk, and a portion of Queen Street all together. And seeing all of these things emerge together, the investment in the Riverwalk, the investment in all-day transit, the new development, the CFI, all the things that are being planned, it's not that difficult to kind of squint and imagine how different this place is going to be in the same way that I showed you those transformations in Toronto. We have identified priority areas for applying this methodology, this kind of thinking in a number of places in the city. Um, and finally, I just want to say a word about the, the Urban Design Review Panel. Because critical as you're doing all of this are feedback loops. To look at what you're doing, to be self-critical, to evaluate it, to make sure that every chess piece you get to play is giving you the maximum benefit. And the role of the Urban Design Review Panel, and it's led by a former colleague of mine, Eric Turcut, who's a very talented architect, and you have some very dedicated people on this panel, is to look at every single project that comes before them, public and private, and make sure that it is adding to the richness, to the value of this community that uh, you, and I dare I say we, are in the process of building. And my final point is I think the future is very bright for Brampton. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to welcome David Crombie to the stage. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, I'm just getting used to this. Is, is this a? I don't need this, right? Oh, good. I am not technically co competent, actually. For, so let me begin. I um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Andrew and his colleagues for inviting me to be here tonight. It gave me a terrific opportunity to watch my old colleague, uh, Ken Greenberg, and, at work. Um, what he gave you tonight is as good as you're going to find in the world. This is a person who understands what he's talking about, has a passion for what he's talking about, and you can understand everything he's saying as he puts it together. So thanks for uniting us again. Um, as I watched him, him organize his thinking and putting it out to you, I found myself getting excited about the possibilities of going from now to 2040 with Brampton. Um, I might say, by the way, in passing, I am no expert in Brampton, but it's a word that I used to love to hear. Because many years ago when I was at City Hall in Toronto, Whenever the provincial government under Bill Davis uh, wanted to give Toronto 
any resources or money, which was unpopular elsewhere, of course, in the province. He would always talk about the virtues of Brampton before he gave us the money. So when I think of Brampton, I think of Bill Davis, and I think of those times that Ken was talking about and the good work that he did. One of the reasons I'm excited about what Ken had to say and what you're doing here in Brampton with respect to moving towards 240 and the new Brampton is that I'm going to be part, at least for a short while, with you. I'm, I'm kind of already on the journey. And I hope we're going to find, I know we will, find some community of interest. So let me begin by saying that I started on this journey, including Brampton, in 2015. In 2015, <clears throat> I was asked by the provincial government of the day if I would chair a group, a panel of people to look at the future of land use planning in the greater Golden Horseshoe. And that is a, that's an area which, of course, is mostly hard for people to envision in their head. It's an immense region. It's bounded, and I, by the way, I wish I had Ken's slides so I could show you this, so I want you to use your imagination as I describe the area of land use planning that we are to engage ourselves in, the greater Golden Horseshoe. On the west, it's from Dufferin, Wellington, and Brant counties, and includes Waterloo region. It goes all the way over to the east, to Northumberland, uh, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Northumberland and Peterborough counties, and the Kawartha Lake region. In the south, uh, it's from Niagara region, Haldeman County, and Lake Erie, and in the north, Simcoe County, Georgian Bay, and the Bruce Peninsula. It's two-thirds of, of the population of the province of Ontario, and it's 70% of Ontario's GDP. It's one of the fastest growing areas in North America. It's land use, and you're part of this, it's land use is dominated by four four plans. The Niagara Escarpment Plan, which was adopted in 1985. The Oak Ridges Moraine Plan, which was adopted in 2002. And the Green Plan in 2005. And the Growth Plan in 2006. Those are the major dominant land, land use plannings for the whole of the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And in February 2015, the province established a panel drawing from land use planners, land developers, local government, environmental planners, a host of people. And their mission was to take those four plans, align them, and make recommendations that would take, make recommendations taking into consideration all the forces of change that would occur between 2015 and 2041. The process was really extensive. We had more than 20 town hall meetings alone, scores and scores of stakeholder meetings, many, many site visits. Altogether, 42,000 submissions of one kind or another. And, 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 and we worked at the same time with the staff, the provincial staff, of six ministries. The report itself, coming out in 2017, the report itself contains 87 recommendations. And all of those recommendations, which were unanimous, by the way, from the panel, were embraced totally by the provincial government. And the government of the day issued its own report uh, based on our report and called it Shaping Land Use in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Its basic elements are worth me just listing for you because they touch also on what Ken was talking about. The basic elements are, first of all, a framework for economic development in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Secondly, recommendations to make sure that we are protecting and preserving both natural heritage and water resources. 
Thirdly, to actually do what's required, do what's possible uh, to begin to create comprehensive and so-called complete communities wherever we could and whenever we could, reducing urban, sp urban sprawl. Fourthly, to ensure agricultural productivity and food security. Fifthly, maintain our response. Maintain our response and find a way to mainstream our response uh, to climate change in the greater Gold North Shore. Six, linking infrastructure, oh glorious day, linking infrastructure investment to land use policies. And seven, promoting awareness and public engagement to make sure that the recommendations over time between now and 2041 are implemented appropriately. And for that, they established a green, the so-called Greenbound Council, whose job it is to oversee those recommendations and their implementation and advise the provincial government on them. And, and the, reason, the reason I'm therefore on the road with you is I chair that community or that, uh, that uh, council. Obviously the Greater Golden Horseshoe is a very, very complicated, comprehensive, wide, deep, diverse place. But what brings it together is a piece of magic. What brings it together, all communities in the Greater Golden Horseshoe share something that is very important to all of them. They share the same conditions of survival everywhere. I'm gonna talk about that just for a second, what they share in terms of survival. I want to step back a little bit from the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and if I could, uh, just dawn on my, a little bit of work that I'd done before in another place. Uh, I had uh, been in Ottawa for a few years, and I was the minister of what was then called Indian Northern Affairs, now Indigenous Affairs, uh, and it's a job for which I was decidedly unqualified. I didn't know much about it. So I found myself traveling north of 60 in the Arctic. Everywhere there were Indian reserves, as they were called in those days. I must have visited about 250 of them. I read myself blind, trying to learn and understand. One of the books I read was a book by a man by the name of Hugh Brody, who was an Englishman, normally wrote about the Arctic, but he wrote a book called Maps and Dreams. And the book, the book itself was about the beaver people who live in north central British Columbia. And you, if you read the book, and you can certainly get it out of the Toronto Public Library, I'm sure you can get it in the, in the Brampton Library, Hugh Brody, Maps and Dreams. If you go through the book, it's a fairly slim volume. But about every 15 pages, you will find these squiggly lines. Looks like kind of just squiggly lines, the center's gone nuts. It, it, they're, not, they're not coherent to you. But what they were and are were the mental maps, the mentor, mental survival maps of their beaver people, both individually and collectively. It told the beaver people where the game could be found. It told them where danger might be. It told them where help could be found if necessary. All of the things they needed for their economic, their social, and their spiritual well-being. The reason there were so many of those squiggly maps is because all things changed. They were, their, their, their mental maps for survival were constantly changing. They were certainly changing every season, but they were changing as new technology came, they were changing as life itself moved along. And so therefore, the mental maps of survival became really important to them and their understanding of how to deal with that change. They used memory, history, myths, ritual, music to help manage that change. My own view when I was from the city of Toronto in these places and understanding what I was learning best I could was that we were very much like the beaver people. 
We all have, all of us, we, we all have our own mental maps of survival, both individually and collectively. And it's, 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 it's the sort of thing that is universal without us really thinking about it. But all of us try and respond to three questions throughout our whole life. Who am I? Where do I belong? And how do I behave? The thing is, the questions are all the same, but as you go through the life cycle, the answers change. Who am I? Where do I belong? How do I behave? And throughout our lives, therefore, we try and figure out how to manage that. And we, we manage it in the same way as the beaver people, through memory and vision. And what we try and do is so organize things that they're familiar as we deal with that change. Um, I remember when China opened up the Olympics and they were trying, they were trying hard to say to a world, we're back. What did they do? They talked mainly about the history of China. Many, many years ago, I say many years ago, in the night, it's now almost 50 years ago, we started a thing in Toronto called Metro Caravan. And at that time, as Ken was pointing out, people were moving into Toronto from all around the world. And the question was, how do we, how do we cope with that? How do we get our arms around that? And one of the answers was, well, let's start a thing called Metro Caravan, and we take all the various groups that are coming and have been here for a while or brand new, and everybody can have 10 days, we'll have a party. And we will, we call them pavilions. We use cities and not countries because people fight over countries. And boundaries and borders became a problem. So we use cities. We had 50 pavilions over the 30 years that, it, that existed. What was important about it? In these pavilions, people learned the language, the culture, the cuisine, the dance, the song, all the things that were familiar, but that could also explain it to other people and therefore became part of the way in which we managed the social change. Now, I think it's also fair to say that whenever we're into finding ourselves new in new places, we look for ways in which to use names in order to make it familiar. So all of that became important, not only to us, but it's important for the rest of the greater Golden Horseshoe because increasingly change is coming at a greater speed. What are the conditions of our survival as communities? Well, they're drawn from our experience. It's not complicated. There are three basic posts around which we deal with it. Economic opportunity and well-being, our relationship, as Ken pointed out, with nature, and the way in which we build our civic community. Let me deal, first of all, with economic well-being. I won't spend a lot of time on these, but it's worth remembering that as Ken was going through the process that he sees over the next while, there is going to be massive, major changes in all, in, in all three of those things. And economic development has always been, in, in economic well-being and opportunity, development has always been changing. Let me give you an example. If you want to look at the impact of change, which is now tame and comfortable for us, when the railroads came in the mid-19th century, it transformed everything. It collapsed time and space like no other invention before it. Um, the American poet Emerson said, the railway iron is a magician's rod in its power to evoke the sleeping energies of land and water. And in Toronto is an example, and I hate to use another example because Ken's used them all, but in the waterfront in 1853, the planners of the day, the visionaries of the day, 
had already established a line along the waterfront, now called the Esplanade. That was to be part of a thing known as walks and gardens. That was to be a kind of way in which Torontonians of the day would transport themselves and enjoy being alive, being alive in the British Empire along the waterfront. What happened, of course, was that the railways came. And they said, hey, are you interested in progress? Are you interested in jobs for your family and your future? We said, of course. And they said, good, we'd like to put our railway right down along the waterfront on top of your walks and gardens. And we said, okay, great. And they did. And we lost for a very long time all the walks and the gardens coming back now, as Ken points out. But on the other hand, what we did get was six generations of economic progress. So it was that change brings both the things you're not looking for, but the things you need and are looking for. Today, of course, we have revolutionary change in our economic world. I won't spend a lot of time, but I just want to list them, just to remind you. We're not talking about some soft, easy change. We're talking about disruptive change. We're talking about, for example, we now live, I don't have to tell you this, a digital revolution. We live in a digital world of robotics, iPhones, emails, artificial intelligence, nanoscience. How many of you know what nanoscience is? I didn't know what nanoscience was. I have a grandson. He's a, thank be the Lord, he's six foot four. We're starting to family off on a whole new bloodline. Uh, his name, Benjamin. He's just finishing his, his uh, doctorate in, in nanoscience, and he deals with particles. I said, what is all that about? What nanoscience? He said, Grandpa, and he looked down at me and he said, it's about little things. <laughs> it turned out to be right. Not only are we living in a digital world, we have globalization of markets and a whole rise of new economic powers, particularly in Asia. We are now trying to figure out how we cope with new sources of energy. How do we deal with the impact of climate change? Already people are moving, I note that Blackstock, and in terms of looking at financial, financial shifts and investment shifts, they're already moving to how do we figure it out? Once the practitioners get there and the advocates have gone, we're now into the reality of the change that climate change is already, as you can see in your nightly news, happening. We've got the rise of, of, of the green economy generally. We have a constant flow of new technologies and new innovations that are looking for ways in which to reorganize. We use the word disruptive now in a way which wouldn't have used it even three or four years ago. And there's been a change, of course, therefore, in the nature of work. And what do we do with the gig economy, economic sharing of assets, and a growing inequality of income? So when it comes to economics as part of our survival, we've got much possible and much to think about and much to do uh, as we cope with it from between now and 2040. But if there's a revolution in our thinking of our economy, there's also been and is ongoing a revolution in our relationship with nature. The greater golden horseshoe has a rich, rich heritage of ideas and wisdoms about how we live with nature and what we do with nature. And I wish I had more time because it's, a, to me, a very interesting part. From indigenous times to European contact to the preservation movement of the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th, which was very big in Canada, to the conservation movement of the 1920s and 30s and 40s, 
to now in the environmental and sustainability movement of our own time. It's an extraordinary history and an extraordinary well of opportunity to find out where we should move with respect to our relationship with nature. We're already figuring out what the framework is. We said that begin with this proposition. This is current wisdom. Everything is connected to everything else. We are part of nature and not separate from it. We are responsible for the consequences of our actions and therefore the idea that we can move in, use up, throw away and move on is no longer on and hasn't been for some while. And finally, that the issues of economy, ecology and community are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are mutually interdependent. We also, of course, have had a major change, revolutionary change in some ways, of our understanding of community. We live in a, this is no secret, we live in, in a global movement of peoples. People have been, are, and will be moving from continent to continent, from continent, from, con from, from, from country to, to uh, countryside, I'm sorry, uh, from continent to continent, from country to country, and from countryside to cities. And that has been transforming the demographic base of, of not only our communities and our cities, but those around the world. We've had to learn new things or, re, or relearn old things. We've had to learn to widen the circle of acceptability for those who are different from us, all of us. We've had to figure out how to cope with that diversity so that we move it into uh, both uh, uh, mainly into some sense of inclusion. Um, someone once asked, what's the difference between assimilation, diversity, and inclusion? So, and the answer was, assimilation said you, you hear that there's a party going on. And integration said you get invited. And inclusion says, you're asked to dance. And I think that that's where we've now found ourselves, and Ken did a nice job tonight evoking that, that sense. We've also, of course, had to re-understand re re how communities work, how neighborhoods work. Because neighborhoods, we reminded ourselves, and are reminding ourselves, are not simply physical places, they are social arenas and they are psychic spaces. So that all of those things, I, I think were well put by Michael Andachi, who's a great Canadian writer. And he said, the idea of community begins with imagination, continues with memory, and we tell stories about it and invest it with meaning. I think those of you who understand your neighborhoods certainly understand that. But if there's one thing that shows the change in community living and our ability to work it, it has got to do with how we built and are building our civic community. Because it, it, it's clear that how we build what I call and others call the public realm. That is going to be a defining characteristic of whether or not we've been successful in moving forward between now and 2040. The, the public realm itself is pretty simple. We all know what's in it. The, the services and institutions that service, serve this community, serve this city. I'm just going to list them for a bit, just to remind you of what you, when you wake up in the morning, is at your disposal. Roads, 
highways, sidewalks, parks, recreation facilities, public transit, coming, schools, colleges, universities, libraries, childcare, welfare facilities, social services, waste management systems, police, fire, uh, police, fire, emergency services, public health facilities, community planning, cultural programs and institutions, housing and shelter. I could go on and on and on. We take them for granted. We, we take them for granted un, un, until there's disruption of some kind. But what I want to do is try and underline why they're not only important for the services, but they are important for the things that they do together beyond the specific services. What are they? They are, first of all, all those services and institutions taken together. There are connective tissues. They connect us in our private worlds with one another and from generation to generation. They're the glue. They're the glue that hold us together daily, 24, 7, 3, 6, 5. And that's true not only here, but around the world. Secondly, those services and institutions, the civic services and institutions provide equity, at least help provide equity and opportunity for all. Look at the schools and the libraries and the parks. There was a man by the name of Bill Moyers, you may remember him, an American. He used to have a program, a public affairs program, and he was from West Texas. And I can remember him doing a program some years ago, and he said, you know, I grew up in West Texas. I didn't know I was poor, because at all of these facilities, at the school, the parks, and I could play on the ball teams, and so on and so forth. That, that ability, of course, comes only with the ability of the, that ability to do so, comes only with the ability of the civic community to provide those services and institutions. Thirdly, they are a platform for economic growth. You look at any study from World Bank, set all those institutions, and they will list all of those things that are really important in order to maintain and grow economically, and every one of them is touched by public services in the public realm. And finally, they're the basis of our social peace. We take our social peace for granted. We really take it for granted. Tune in to any television, radio, streaming, whatever you're doing, and look around the world and find out that the social peace we enjoy here is not not around the rest of the world a lot. So I thought what I wanted to do was explain what I think is beneath the planning, below the planning, was the context of the planning that Ken talked about. Because unless we pay attention to those and to the leadership that he talked about, leadership coming from everybody, then we won't get to 2040 in the way we want. So I was asked if I might take the experience I've had over the years. Um, I mean, you get to be an old guy, experience is really all you got left. Um, that was a joke. Um, at any rate, I was asked if I would give some thoughts out about what has been my experience when you take on big projects when you take on projects that are transformative, when you take on projects that are beginning are not clear to people because it's so large and so complicated maybe, but also people don't pay attention all the time. But, so I, I've got three or four, I'm just gonna pass on before I leave. They may be of use, they were use to me. First of all, pay attention to the quality and the soundness of your own ideas first. Because the, the ideas that will matter to you, the only ideas that will matter to you, are the ideas that are yours at the end of the day. It's, it's really important 
because you don't, you're not taking the ideas that matter off the shelf. The ideas that really matter to you come from your own experience. They're sucked up from your own roots, your own sense of identity, your own experiences, your own hopes, your own fears. But if you have that sense that you have gone over it and understand it, then you've got a strong belief in your own mission. You've got an ability to help build a constituency for your own cause. And it's really important because when the hard winds blow, and they will, it will not be a cakewalk between 2000 up to 2040. When the winds blow strong, if you've got that sense of what you believe in and why you believe in it, then you'll have the strength to stand against the winds. I found that out. If I could use a personal example. Ken was talking about the downtown plan. And we had to bring in a 45-foot height bylaw, which meant for two, two and almost two and a half years, no building in downtown Toronto higher than 45 feet. And no, it, you don't need that now. The Planning Act allows you to take time out and do some planning. In those days, you couldn't. So we had to find a way. So we brought in a 45-foot height bylaw. 45, 45-foot height bylaw. Most people thought I was just trying to make the city closer to my own understanding. But it was really interesting about it. it all the official agencies and organizations in town were opposed to it. I can remember coming home and seeing my wife, Shirley. Kids were waiting for dinner. And in that day, on one day alone, the Globe and Mail had said I was stealing the bread out of the mouths of widows and orphans. Star said I was stealing the heart of a great city. The labor unions were totally opposed, as was the business community, as was the land development industry. And I can remember Shirley saying, good day, eh? <laughs> How's it going? But I understood one thing. We really believed in what we were doing. And we had a secret. The public, we've been carefully making sure that we were working with the public. The public understood, and they were with us. And at the end of the day, we were able to see it through. Secondly, Leadership comes from listening. Sounds like, sounds like a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Leadership comes from listening and learning. It comes through dialogue. It, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's not looking for compromise. Nobody went up the hill to save the hill for half a hill. What you're looking for is a new truth that you can find that everybody can climb on. And what that does as well is give you a moral framework which allows for other people to trust you. It's really, that's essential. Thirdly, planning, and Ken was on to this, planning is a social enterprise. It's not about power. Sometimes it is in short jaunts. But it's really about finding ways in which to create human relationships and human partnerships. That's what it's about. Four, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You have to know when you've got most of what you want. If you strive for perfection, it's 100%. The, tr the problem is you're not allowing space for other people. And so therefore, as someone once said, not me, but I'll use it, Canadians understand more than most, and I don't know why that's so, but it's what they said, good enough. Now if I say, oh, that's good enough, that's not, that, that's not very uplifting. But if I said, that's good enough, that's uplifting. You have to find, give space for other people to win at the same time. Um, and fifth, look for ways in which there's actually good, solid opportunity for public enterprise. The old-fashioned term, 
St. Lawrence that Ken talked about, that neighborhood, was a product of public enterprise. It brought together the private sector, public, public sector, and the community crowd. Most of the buildings there were co-op buildings. So making sure that you're bringing people money and I, or money, people, resources, uh, and ideas together, that's what entrepreneurship is, and that's also a public, and not merely a private industry, and, and, and can be very productive. Finally, or almost finally, um, and Ken was on to this, and I don't have to spend any time on it, have a regional imagination. Um, boundaries and borders should not be the end of things. They should be welcome mats for people to come and people to go. Most of the great projects that I was ever involved in understood that it wasn't just your space that was important. It's how that space fit into everybody else's space in a way that all could, or at least try hard, so that all could win. And then finally, you have to have a sense of humor. Um, particularly if you're involved in big projects. So next time you're not happy, I'd like you to think of this story. It comes from the Bible. Uh, it's the story of Moses. Uh, you may not... Uh, know the story of Moses, quite the same as I recall it. But one day, Moses was sitting under a tree and a, uh, a messenger of the Lord uh, came to him and said, Moses, I have good news and bad news. Um, and what would you like first? And Moses said, sir, I'd, I'd like to have the good news. And he said, okay. He said, if Pharaoh will not let your people go free, the children of Israel go free. He will smite all their, if, uh, if Pharaoh will not let, the Lord will smite all uh, Egyptians' borders with frogs. Place a grievous brain on the cattle and on the camel. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the firstborn of each, each living species shall die. He'll infect their flax and the barley. And after that, the Lord will part the Red Sea and the children of Israel will go free. Moses said, that's... That's fantastic. What's the bad news? And he said, you, Moses, have to write the environmental impact study. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, so much. Thank you David. Now I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite both David and Ken back onto the stage, and we're going to give everyone an opportunity. Um, I'm wondering if we can raise the, the lights a little bit so we can see the audience. Uh, if anybody has some questions for Ken or David or both, uh, there are microphones set up back in the, the middle of the audience there, and just please make your way towards there, and uh, great opportunity to ask both speakers some questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, yes. Hello. <laughs> Um, one of the projects that you mentioned was the King Street Pilot Project. I was working at King in Portland at the time when the project launched, and I remember a lot of businesses there were very disappointed at the city, and they didn't like the idea of it taking away vehicular traffic because they saw them as potential customers. And I think when the time that it launched, it was close to winter, and they blamed their economic downfall on the project as opposed to the natural fluctuation of the seasons. Um, I was wondering how you ensure that data-driven initiatives don't get derailed by skepticism and politicizing of these kinds of solutions. Okay, um, it's a great question. And I'm gonna pick up on David's last joke about the environmental assessment to answer it. One of the, one of the really interesting things about doing pilots is that instead of just doing a theoretical analysis of what might happen, which is what environmental assessments do, basically engineers usually will take a situation like that and they will say, this is how we, based on usually looking back at past performance, 
this is how the traffic will behave, this is how the pedestrians will behave. Uh, you could apply that to what the impacts on the businesses would be, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a lengthy process. Um, and in the end, you come to a conclusion based on an analytical framework and theory. The advantage of a pilot is you can actually test it out and see how it works. So you're right. There were some business people who were very afraid that their businesses depended on people being able to drive a private automobile up to the front of their establishments, get out, and go into a restaurant. And actually, it wasn't a large group of people, but it was a very vociferous group of people. So the city said, fine, we'll do a pilot. We'll test it out. And we will see how people actually behave. So they looked at what happened to the traffic. They looked at pedestrian flows. Most importantly, they looked at how businesses performed. And what they discovered at the end of the day was that the businesses, which was, had been the concern, largely performed better. And here's the irony. The people who had been the loudest, one individual in particular, I don't know if, if you followed this in the press, but he actually erected a sculpture in front of his establishment, which was flipping the bird to the city. So, so dis, discontented was he. He actually ended up with one of the most successful cafes, sidewalk cafes in front of his establishment, the Kit Kat on King Street. So I think the lesson in that is, and, and this goes back to Jane Jacobs, who, David, can I say she was a teacher to both of us? Observation. Don't, Jane was a great empiricist. She actually looked at how the world actually operates, which was the way she was able to um, take a lot of planning theory, which had been so unhelpful for such a long time, and by watching how people actually behaved, how cities actually work, literally transformed the way all of us operate and think. And so the, the King Street pilot in microcosm was a great example where in theory it never would have worked. It would have been a failure. But in practice, it was a wonderful success. If I could, excuse me, if I could add, uh, the, uh, Ken's absolutely right. Without the, there being a pilot, I, I used it every day. Uh, so I watched and I listened and, and I knew most of the uh, shopkeepers along there. Al Carbone, who owns the Kit Kat, an old friend. Um, and he would go on and on and on. He would have been able to go on and on and on and issue, in a sense, what were the older truths. But the pilot allowed us to break through that by being able to show that there is new data that allowed for a new truth. And so it was, a, it was a clear, if there's a, as good an example as I could think of, that using a pilot uh, to, uh, is, is really important. Particularly so today, people take, take data seriously. So uh, that's why it worked. There's no doubt about it. It would not have happened without the pilot. Okay, let's go back to this microphone over here. Hi. Um, so I was living on the Esplanade around 2012, 2013, actually, in a building that you portrayed. And I remember at that time, there was a lot of projects going on in Toronto. The King Street Corridor was just a little bit after that, but there was, I remember, there would be Liberty Village. There was more development on the Esplanade. Um, uh, there was King West. Some of the buildings were also going up. Um, and it really changed a lot of areas. And you had originally mentioned with the foot traffic. But I guess what I don't understand is how are you able to get even the initial recognition and the buy-in, number one, to do that, especially if people aren't necessarily living in the area yet because the facilities haven't really been built in that area. Like, how do you recognize that, number one? And number two, how do you get the buy-in from not only just community members, but also the business members and also, you know, the various departments and city hall staff um, and all those other areas to be able to everyone come together and say, we want to make this investment because we know this is what's going to drive the economic growth. So you were, were you talking about the Bentway? 
not necessarily Bentway, more where we are seeing more of the residential growth in the area with a mix, or I guess mixed use and also residential areas across Toronto, because I just found that a lot of it was happening around the same decade. Okay, I'll, I'll try the more general question. Yeah. Um, I think there was a, an extraordinary pent up desire because of the, the changing nature of what I call the North American dream for people to live in places where they wouldn't have to drive. I'll put it that simply. A lot of young people, I don't know if you know the statistic, but now in North America between age 16 and 34, 26% do not have driver's licenses. They have chosen a way of life where they simply don't want to rely on a car. So there was almost an irresistible move which the market was responding to, to create opportunities for people to live in the heart of the city. Um, the, I think the issue is how you do it. And one of my colleagues, um, the great North American urban designer, Jonathan Barnett, says it's not how dense you make it, it's how you make it dense. And I think the, the burden that we're struggling with now is in the absence of a strongly articulated civic vision, which David was describing, for what we can broadly call the public realm, what you get is just a collection of condos. You get a bunch of big towers. And it can be a soulless kind of place that Yes, you've crammed a lot of people into a small area, and you might say you're using land more sustainably, but it's hardly a satisfying form of community. And the struggle we're going through now is how do we actually make viable neighborhoods as human ecosystems? And I'll, I'll take this from David, bringing that ecosystem planning into the way we think about it, and how do we deploy a combination of public resources and private resources to address the needs of the full gamut of the community. And I think if you can start to demo, for a long time, the reaction we were having to development was, and, and David will remember this in Toronto, there was a generation of massive development that was starting to take place in the 1970s, and people hated it, because it, it lacked the qualities of neighborhood. And I think we're starting now to just figure out how to make great new neighborhoods, not just save the old ones that we really liked, but to make great new ones. And so, for example, uh, the West Donlands, which was the Pan Am Athletes Village, is an example of that. Regent Park has turned out to be a great new neighborhood. And I think, what, you know, applying that to Brampton, that we have to prove that in places like Queen Street, like Shoppers World, like some of the other areas that have been identified, we can make places where people want to live, where young people want to raise families, where it has the qualities that they're looking for. Not just affordable dwelling places, but all the other things that go with community life that make it satisfying and attractive. And in order to do that, we need to figure out how to work with the private sector, obviously, but also to get all the actors in the public sector together and figure out how do we get the schools, how do we get the daycare centers, how do we get the parks and public spaces, how do we get recreation, how do we get arts and culture, how do, get, how do we get all these things working together? And we're using the expression community hubs to express that, but I, I think that's the trick, and I think it goes back to the pilot, too. If you can show success and people can see what it looks like, they will come on board. Yeah, <clears throat> I probably, I'll do this quickly, but I, uh, I'm engaged, have been engaged now for 10 years as the chair of a thing known as the Toronto Lands Corporation. Um, we now have in our portfolio all schools of the Toronto District School Board, primary and secondary. That's about 600 you know, odd spaces in the city. The, the city is the second, the city's the largest landowner in Toronto. The second largest landowner is the school board. Because they've been separate for such a long time, 
their, their, their ability to get together, even those two, let alone others, has been difficult. So 10 years ago, when they started the Toronto Lands Corporation, we were asked as an arm's length body of the Toronto School Board to deal with the property, to deal with initially with surplus properties, but now all properties, both planning and, and disposal of them. A. B. The City of Toronto um, is now doing the same thing and has done so in the last two or three years. We have a thing called Create TO. And Create TO and the, the Toronto Lands Corporation now have at their disposal, working together, a great opportunity to use land. Sorry. You didn't hear the first part? <laughs> Well, it, it didn't matter. Um, but at any rate, it's now got an opportunity to, to bring together land, public landholders with private sector and community forces. That's how you're going to be able to get the hub. And so it, it, the, the, the idea of the hub and not having a car, all of that, that, that that's not for everybody at any given, anybody wherever you live. There's lots of places that you need a car. But downtowns of major cities is not one of them. I walk the city a lot. I don't own a car. I walk the city a lot, take public transit. The clumsiest vehicle in downtown Toronto for getting around is not the bike or the, or the skateboard or the chair or any of the, or the scooter even, right? It's the car. It's a great lump of, it just gets in the bloody road, right? Now that's not true if I lived up in Markham. It may be true in Markham sometime, but, but, but one should not misunderstand that in this large cities, and like Brampton will become in a very short time, it is going to be looking for ways in which people can live by walking to work, by walking to shop, by, by using or by all of those other kind of uh, vehicles for travel. Okay, a couple you. more questions. Jonathan? Thank you. You mentioned the importance of public uh, being part of the uh, uh, discussions and vision. I'm wondering with Brampton 2040, uh, it seems to me that the vision that is being proposed is so drastically different than the Brampton that everybody knows. And I'm wondering if you might think that many of the people that live in Brampton have chosen to live in Brampton. They've, they can afford the house that they live in. It's a single detached home. And now you're proposing that you're sort of like saying that lifestyle we don't think is appropriate going forward. And they're used to driving 20 minutes and getting a free parking spot, and now it takes 40 minutes. And now you're going to tell me it's an hour and I'm not even get a parking spot. So I'm wondering, your vision is wonderful. The politicians uh, municipally, they're only going to be re-elected uh, sometimes by listening to the people that vote, which I think is a very small segment of the population. How do you... Who does the leading? Are, are the politicians going to drag the people along with them, or how do the people that may be skeptical to this new vision, how do they embrace it? Well, uh, my own, well, my own bias is that that um, uh, politicians get a bad rap, um, I, 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 and I think that's particularly true with local uh, lo local uh, politicians. Um, this whole event. Brampton 240, 2040, and the process you've been going through with the official planning process, and the mayor here tonight, and the councillor, Charmaine. Charmaine. Um, um, they, they, are, they are great testimony of the fact that it would not happen without the action taken by these people. Now, are they pushed by other people? Of course, we're all pushed into doing the right thing, no matter what it is. But very often you'll find that local politicians are leading it as well, and not just being pushed. Um, it, it, it seems to me that, that once you've got, that's why I spent a little bit of time earlier, if you're clear in the idea, and you know that you can, you want to get engaged and, and get the public engaged and create a constituency, politicians will pay attention to constituencies. When we built St. Lawrence, we needed lots and lots of money from the federal government and the provincial government and wherever we else we could get. And we need the participation of the development industry. Now, all of that came from being able to create a public narrative 
and we were able to do so because people wanted to get it done. So, I, I, and I think the role of politicians are key. Now, I admit I'm biased. Some of my best friends are politicians. I'm, I'm gonna just add a couple of things to what David has said. Let's just say for the sake of argument, what you've said is true. It, however, is not possible for Brampton to add another four or 500,000 people in the geographic area that you occupy and continue to have it function based on that paradigm. It's simply physically impossible. So something has to shift. That's one thing. The second thing is that the population is not homogeneous. People are looking for options, and there are a lot of people, especially younger people, who are attracted to a different way of living. And I think we have to offer some options within Brampton that make that really attractive, that make that really appealing. And thirdly, that doesn't mean that we're going to go to all those neighborhoods that people have bought into and they really like and they feel invested in and start evicting people from their homes. These things will overlap in time. And it's really about change at the margin. That's the key. So as change proceeds, and, and you know, Andrew will be the first to say when he's explaining the official plan, it's, it's not just about an end state that we're going from one world and then suddenly we're going to pull the rug out and there'll be a completely different world. It's about a process by which change happens over time. And one, one of the great things I think that I've always learned from David is that sense of history. That if, if, you, if you don't think of planning as a series of still photographs, but you think of it as a film sequence, and you can see how change occurs, it's much easier to actually grasp the notion of profound change, but it happens incrementally. And I'll, I'll give you one simple example. When I was working for the city of Amsterdam for three and a half years, when I started working there, and you know, people think of Amsterdam as this bicycle paradise. When I started working there in the late 90s, the plein, P-L-E-I-N, the squares in Amsterdam were parking lots, just like what I showed you in St. Lawrence. The, the canals where we love to walk now were all lined with parked cars. And the city of Amsterdam instituted a policy called auto lu, auto reduction. And the idea was every year they would remove some parking spaces and they would improve the headways on the trams and add some bicycle lanes. But they did it gradually. And they did it so that over time, pretty quickly, you could walk along the edges of the canals and hear your footsteps again. But they didn't suddenly come in in one year and say, we're going cold turkey, we're going to change everything all at once and completely disrupt your lives. Okay, we're almost out of time. I think we've got two, two final questions up here. I think, Sylvia, you were first. Yes. Hi, my name is Sylvia. Um, so uh, in 2019, City Council is very proud to announce a 0% property tax increase in the budget, not a ad inflation, but 0%. At the end of last year, the mayor says he wants to ensure another 0% increase. Council voted unanimously to get the, have the province restart Highway 413. Given that, how do you shift the city away from cars? Um, I'm not running for council. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, I, I, I don't know how I can respond to it. So I, I don't think I will. I'm not sure what they'll do here. Um, but uh, I guess generally speaking, um, you get what you pay for. So uh, if, thing, if, if, you, if, you, if the only way you can actually get more, more money is to have higher taxes. So uh, the last time I heard anyone uh, run on a platform of higher taxes um, was actually not so long ago. It was, it was Justin Trudeau. That's what he did in the last election. Yeah. 
So I'm, if I got your question right, not, my, not hearing so well, was the question of whether or not you're going to be able to do things if you don't get more, if you only have zero, if that's the question, then I think that that will be a time uh, when things begin to grow, things begin to move, uh, there will be a readdressing uh, of, of that position. So I, I'll give you a more recent example. John Tory, after saying endlessly, no tax increase beyond the rate of inflation, recently announced a new supplementary tax because he finally came to the conclusion that at the rate in which the city was growing, it was not possible to provide the infrastructure, social infrastructure, hard infrastructure that the city needs. It was a very substantial tax increase, and I believe the vote at city council was virtually unanimous with one dissenting vote. And it has not caused a ripple politically, and that came about for the reason that David said, that people saw the things they cared about in their lives being eroded, and they finally came to the conclusion that they would rather pay to have good services than have things continue to deteriorate. Okay, and last question of the night. Hi, my name is Sushil. Uh, having lived in Ottawa, Toronto, and uh, Vancouver, I, uh, after listening to all this, I really applaud and compliment the results as well as the processes and efforts that have go gone into all these plannings. And uh, my uh, ob one observation and one small question. Uh, this uh, issue about using data and uh, you know, uh, analytics versus uh, POC and actual testing it out. So while planning, uh, you couldn't have foreseen uh, things that we, we got from the uh, actual test and result. So on a similar line, there was a test uh, for this uh, smart city. Uh, I was hoping to hear something, you know, your experiences and um, um, an outside pers or maybe perspective. I'm not sure if you were involved in that. That smart city initiative and uh, then it's being withdrawn or what are the learnings from that? If I could throw any light that in Toronto, that what is it called? Smart Street City or something? So I, I think the question was about smart cities. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they were going to have those cars being, uh, um, but they didn't get parking lot or something. Then it was withdrawn. Andrew, I, it's, the no, sound is very muffled. It's, it's a little hard yeah, to hear. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding the question as well. Um, uh, the, 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 in to Toronto Smart City, some plan was there that that uh, is part way tested and not fully tested, right? Oh, I, th I think he's asking questions about sidewalk labs, smart yeah, city. Yeah, so I think can, can you break? That's right. <laughs> okay, you're asking about sidewalk labs. Uh, yeah, I was hoping to uh, get some your opinion and perspective. You know, because I see there's a lot of uh, um, talent on the. Okay, so I, I think it's about get, getting your opinion on Sidewalk Labs. Okay, I, I will tell you right away, I've been working with Sidewalk Labs, and I will tell you why. Um, I began working with Sidewalk Labs before it was Sidewalk Labs, back in 2015, before they ever thought about coming to Toronto. And again, I'm going to make reference to the change that comes upon us that David was talking about it. Like it or not, technology, just as the railways transformed the world in the middle of the 19th century and the cars transformed the world in the middle of the 20th century, the digital revolution is transforming our world now. And it's transforming cities. And what is important about Sidewalk Labs is that this is happening to us, like it or not, and Sidewalk Labs is offering a rare opportunity, and we're seeing that play out now, to actually think um, critically about the use of technology, to be able to discuss when to use it, 
when we should go low-tech, when we should go no-tech, and when we should avail ourselves of what technology has to offer in cities, and how do we negotiate the protocols in terms of what is public, what is private, who owns the data, um, when can data be commercialized, when do we want to see sensors, when do we not want to see sensors, all those things are being discussed on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's experimental. It is a test bed. It is a pilot. It will try out a lot of things. Not all of them will be successful, but in 12 acres of land on, on Toronto Harbor, we will actually be able to see how a lot of things might work in terms of how we move, how we use public space, how people interact, how we deal with building systems, all of those things. I think it will be a tremendous learning experience that we can then apply, and people in fact are already applying it in cities around the world as we try and figure out what this new wave of technological change means. Yeah, if I, you know, if I could add, <clears throat> if people don't understand things, then the, they then go usually next to, who can I trust? And one of the things that has happened with Sidewalk Labs in the past short while is that the leadership of Waterfront Toronto, which has response, overall responsibility other than the city for the project, changed its leadership. I'm not blaming the old leadership, but the new leader is a man by the name of Diamond, Steve Diamond. He's a land developer, was a lawyer. His father was Eve Diamond from Cadillac Fairview. The man and his family have been here a long time. He not only has private sector understanding, but he also has a great cachet with the public he dealt with forests and trees and so on. So leadership changed, and now you're finding that people who had apprehension before are at least saying, I think I can listen because Steve is there and the mayor is there, and out of that, the city will be safe. That is a bit of a leap, but not much. So I'll just add one more thing. Uh, a great book that I would recommend to everybody, it's a little known book by Jane Jacobs, it's called Systems of Survival. And in that book, it, she constructs it as a kind of dialogue among neighbors. She lays out why it's important to have both a very strong and able public sector to protect the public interest, as you have a strong entrepreneurial culture and she talks about the guardians being the public sector and the traders, not traitors, but traders, the entrepreneurs, and how they have different ethical systems. And the fact that for a city to be successful, you have to have a dialectical relationship between these two. And if you lose that, if we didn't have the Steve Diamond and the board and right. the mayor and the city right. stepping up, if the city were too weak, and we turned over the management of the city to Alphabet or Sidewalk Labs, this would not be a good thing. And yesterday, I did an interview on Radio Canada, because the province has come up with what I think is an insane idea, which is that developers should be allowed to hire their own building inspectors to review code compliance and inspect their buildings. And talk about conflict of interest. It's, it's hard to imagine something that lends itself to more problems. And I, I cited that, when I did an interview, I, that very important principle of maintaining the integrity of the public sector in dealing with the private sector. They're very different roles, and we have to understand the need for both. So uh, is there a consultative process there also, or is it more, more closed? Thing. I think the question was what, what kind of consultative process was involved in that? Uh, and in future, would it be the, like that? Like any lateral thinking would be incorporated or not? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, I, th I think the question is about ensuring that uh, the community is engaged in processes like that and developments like that. And we absolutely yeah. do that kind in of In the past and the future, both. Yep. Okay, um, so thank you very much for your questions. Uh, I want to thank a big round of applause for Ken and David. Thank you. Thank you.